So for this salt and sea water quality webinar, um, I'm happy to introduce our moderator, uh, Professor Tim Lyons. Uh, Dr. Lyons is a distinguished professor of biogeochemistry at UC Riverside and leads the Alternative Earths team of the NASA Astrobiology Institute, along with a long list of other credentials. Uh, among other things, his lab is currently investigating biogeochemical cycling in the Salton Sea. Professor Lyons. Thanks very much, Mike. Let me go ahead and start sharing my slides. So it's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm honored to be a participant and this is a subject that's very close to my heart and those that work in my group. And so I'm only gonna take a, a couple of minutes to give you just a very brief overview um, that will frame a little bit of the detail that you're gonna be hearing from the true experts who are working in these areas. Um, many of you know the problems in the Salton Sea, but just to give you a little bit of historical context, the Salton Sea sits in a low point. It's a couple of hundred feet below sea level because it sits on the San Andreas Fault. And so there's a depression and water flows in and it doesn't flow out. It's only lost through evaporation and it has been wet and dry naturally over time scales of, of hundreds and thousands of years. And that reflects changing climate, natural changes, and also the changing course of the Colorado River. Uh, but that all changed dramatically as many of you or most of you will know in 1905 when it, an irrigation canal um, being put in to develop agriculture along the margin of that basin, then dry basin, uh, was breached because of intense flooding on the Colorado River. And so you can see, hopefully, my cursor showing this dramatic flooding again in 1905. And then it desiccated because they fixed that breach and the water was no longer flowing uncontrolled into the basin. But then we see a rapid, well, less rapid, but a progressive increase in, in lake level reflecting agricultural runoff. And so we all know this, that it's a lake that, again, historically has been wet and dry, and now it is unnaturally wet because of the agriculture. And that carries really important implications because it's not just water, it's all the things that are dissolved in water coming off of fields. Uh, and also the components that are in the river naturally, but it's in particular those things coming from agriculture that we care about. And the thing that we're all here for today is, is, is really the, the fact that water management policies are changing and the Salton Sea is shrinking. And depending on which scenario plays out, ultimately it will get dry quickly, dry slowly, completely dry, not completely dry. These are all details that are very much under debate. And as the lake level drops, the uh, salinity rises, which is the red curve that you're seeing there. And so all of this has had profound implications on the ag, uh, for the, ag, uh, the ecology of the, of the Salton Sea. And so here are the fields on the southern margin of the Salton Sea draining in copious amounts of fertilizer. This is something that we call eutrophication. That is increasing in a dramatic way the amount of nutrient or fertilizer within the basin. And so the fields are running off and carrying that material um, with those waters and also the water is evaporating and the concentrations are becoming higher and higher as the lake level drops and the amount of water um, becomes smaller and smaller. Because remember, anything that's dissolved in the water stays behind, it's just the water itself that goes off. And so fertilizer nutrient concentrations are increasing, metal concentrations, other important components that you'll hear more about today. And so there has really been a combined effect of increasing salinity and because of the nutrients for reasons that you'll hear about, decreasing oxygen within the basin that have really dramatically impacted the fish populations and because of that, the bird populations. So the, so the ecology is nothing like it was even a short time ago. And it's by many measures only gonna get worse. And then ultimately, depending on which water mint strategy we go with, um, some or all of this 320, roughly 320 square miles will be exposed. And this is a picture from Owens Lake, but a similar scenario could play out where these many square miles of, of lake floor are now exposed to the winds and the material is picked up. And so we all know that there are pulmonary issues already on the margins. 
But a point that I always like to make, and I think Caroline will make today, is that the muds in the middle of the basin are likely more enriched in metals and more enriched in pesticides than what is being exposed now. So the problem is not gonna get better, as we know. There'll be more dust and potentially more harmful dust as the lake continues to recede. And so we and many other groups are, are devoting serious amounts of energy and resources, financial and, 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 and temporal time resources to try to come up with solutions. And one of the challenges is to try and work cooperatively across all these different fronts because there are many different stakeholders and, and many people care about a particular thing, perhaps more than something else. And in the end, the solution is only gonna come when we find something that meets to the best of possibility, all of those concerns. So we have a group of really outstanding people today, five uh, very prestigious scientists, um, and they're a reflection of the quality of the kind of work being done there and the quality of the people who are doing that work. And so one of the messages today would be that uh, for those of you who live near the lake, we're with you and we're, and we're trying our best to figure something out and we're glad that you're with us today. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce the first of our speakers. Um, so give me a chance to uh, switch over here and I will share a different set of slides and then pull up, pull up my notes on the speakers. Okay, our first speaker is, um, a second here. Uh, so the, as I said, we have five really wonderful speakers that are gonna cover a broad range of relevant topics. And, and those range from the broad issues of water quality, policy regulation, implementation, an, an overview of the kind of monitoring that is and will happen. Uh, from there, we're gonna talk about nutrients, um, the fertilizers the materials from these fields that are used to help grow the crops that end up being in excess and are washed into the sea. So the, new, the fertilizers that are flowing into the sea. And then we're gonna talk about the, the, the fertilizers, the nutrients that are in the sea, and you'll learn why that even matters, why that affects the ecology of the lake and the way that harmful materials are distributed throughout the, the bottom muds and how those will or can eventually be incorporated into dust and transported into the surrounding communities. So we'll learn about the biogeochemical and ecological consequences of those nutrients. And then we'll hear a specific story about one very important metal and its ecological relationships, that is selenium. So our first speaker, um, as I said, it's a very um, prestigious group of speakers and we're fortunate to have them with us today. Our first speaker, speaker is, uh, uh, is Paula Rasmussen. Uh, Paula holds a master's degree in environmental engineering and a bachelor's degree in biological sciences, both from USC. She serves as the executive officer of the Colorado River Basin Regional Water Quality Control Board. From that position, she manages the Regional Water Board, which covers the southeastern part of the California. Prior to becoming the executive officer, she served as an assistant executive officer for the Los Angeles Regional Board. And then prior to these water board positions, she was at the Department of Toxic Substances Control for over 15 years as a manager for the compliance program and for the unified program. Her primary experience was with hazardous waste enforcement and with development of the unified program for Cal EPA. So Paula will speak to us today on the Colorado River Basin regional water quality broadly and the Salton Sea specifically from the standpoint of policy reg and regulation implementation and monitoring. Okay. So at this point, I will pull up your slides. Give me one second to do so. And we will go to the beginning. So. Okay, ready to start whenever you are, Paula. Thank you. Um, also joining us today in this presentation is uh, Emma McCorkle. Emma is our unit chief for our planning programs. And thank you for including the regional board in the webinar today. We're uh, very excited to be here. Uh, next slide, please. The mission, um, well, first of all, we're going to provide some background on the role of the water boards and focus on some of the planning efforts and activities that are within the Salton Sea watershed. 
The mission of the California Water Board is to preserve, enhance, and restore the quality of waters for current and future generations. Created in 1967, the State Water Resources Control Board protects water quality by setting statewide policy, coordinating and supporting the regional board efforts, and reviewing petitions that contest regional board actions. Together with the regional boards, the state board is authorized to implement the Federal Clean Water Act in California. Next slide, please. There are nine regional water quality control boards. They are semi-autonomous and comprised of seven part-time board members appointed by the governor and confirmed by the Senate. Regional boundaries are based on watersheds and water quality requirements are based on the unique differences within each watershed. Each regional board makes critical water quality decisions for its region, including setting standards, issuing waste discharge requirements, determining compliance with those requirements, and taking appropriate enforcement actions. As shown on the slide, the Colorado River Basin Regional Water Board covers much of Riverside, San Bernardino, and Imperial counties. The state of California is required by both state and federal law to protect water quality within the state. The Porter Cologne Water Quality Control Act is a state law that grants authority to the State Water Resources Control Board and the nine regional water quality control boards and establishes responsibilities pertaining to waters of the state. Next slide, please. The Water Quality Control Plan, referred to as the Basin Plan, is the central regulatory document for ensuring water quality in the Colorado River Basin region. The Basin Plan describes and defines the regional water board activities. It contains beneficial uses, water quality objectives to protect the beneficial uses, implementation agreements, monitoring plans, and other policies in effect. As a living document, it is subject to changes as needed to reflect the status of water bodies or revised objectives. Next slide, please. To meet federal and state requirements, the Regional Water Board must review the Basin Plan every three years in what's called the Triennial Review. The Triennial Review develops a ranked list of projects that would result in potential changes to the Basin Plan. The latest Triennial Review list includes projects to be developed between January of 2021 and December of 2023. The ranking criteria were identified based on public input and board priorities. For the 2020 Triennial Review, two major ranking criteria for the projects included whether the project addresses impairments affecting the Salton Sea and whether it addresses water quality issues in environmental justice communities. Because the fate of the Salton Sea is a key environmental justice issue, many of the top ranking projects are within the Salton Sea watershed. Thank you. Our next slide, thank you. Most of the Salton Sea projects on the 2020 Triennial Review List are total maximum daily loads, or TMDLs. These are water pollution control plans that must be developed to address water quality impairments which are identified on the federal 303D list of impaired waters. The Salton, Sheet, the Salton Sea watershed TMDLs are shown on the slide here, and many of these are currently in development. Next slide, please. There are two other projects prioritized on the Triennial Review, 
which involve basin plant amendments to review or establish beneficial uses as shown here. Beneficial uses describe how each water body is used. Examples of beneficial uses include municipal and domestic supply or wildlife habitat, among others. Next slide, please. This regional water board is coordinating closely with the California Natural Resources Agency as it implements the Salt and Sea Management Program. Many of the projects proposed in the management 10-year plan will involve dredge or fill activities that require a water quality certification or a dredge or fill permit and enrollment in the stormwater construction general permit. Regional board staff meet and confer frequently with natural resources agency staff on these activities. Next slide, please. Aquatic habitat restoration and dust suppression projects will require regional board permits, including water quality certification, dredger fill permits, and stormwater construction general permits. The species conservation habitat restoration project that began construction in January of 2021 required an amendment to the existing Clean Water Act section 401 water quality certification that was issued in 2013. The water quality certification amendment was issued by this regional board in December of 2020. Next slide, please. The regional water board is coordinating with the Natural Resources Agency on water quality monitoring needs and implementation. Staff were involved during the development of the monitoring and implementation plan, advising on monitoring and data needs for water quality assessment. Data will be needed by the regional board to assess beneficial use attainment as aquatic habitat restoration projects are completed in order to develop water quality standards. In addition, the Regional Water Board will need data specific to the water pollution control plans, the TMDLs, that have been prioritized in the 2020 Triennial Review. Staff from both agencies are engaging to discuss plans for water quality monitoring. And the Regional Board also participates in the Salt and Sea Management Program Long Range Plan Committee, which was established by the Natural Resources Agency. Next slide, please. The Regional Water Board conducts water quality monitoring on the New River at the US-Mexico border. The Regional Board also coordinates with state and local agencies on the implementation of the New River Improvement Project. The New River Improvement Project implements phase one of the New River Strategic Plan which was developed by the California-Mexico Border Relations Council. The strategic plan looked at the entirety of the New River with a phased approach for recommended programs and projects to address water quality issues. The New River Improvement Project focuses on the Calexico Reach. Phase one project includes a trash screen a bypass encasement for the flows of the New River and a pump back system. This project will divert New River water flows underground to bypass the city of Calexico. The project will minimize human contact with the polluted river. The city of Calexico, as the lead agency for the project, is currently working with the permitting agencies to move the New River Improvement Project forward. The city of Calexico is starting the bid process and anticipates that construction will start this summer. Next slide, please. The Federal Clean Water Act requires that all non-point sources of pollution be regulated. California meets that requirement through the implementation of its non-point source policy. The policy recognizes the advantages of third-party programs and relies on the implementation 
of management practices by dischargers to minimize sources of pollution. The implementation of management practices by themselves do not constitute compliance with the non-point source policy. An adaptive management approach is required. Implementing man management practices that target the pollution source is the first step. Monitoring the management practices makes sure that they are working properly and reducing pollution. When problems are found, improved or additional management practices are implemented. The process is repeated over and over and in time will result in more effective pollutant, pollutant source control and achievement of water quality standards. Next slide, please. One program implementing the non-point source policy is the regulation of agricultural discharges by the Regional Water Board. Agricultural discharges include irrigation return flows or tailwater, subsurface drainage from tile drains or seepage to groundwater, and stormwater runoff. These can contain pollutants such as sediments, nutrients, pesticides, pathogens, and heavy metals. All agricultural discharges are non-point source discharges as defined by the Federal Clean Water Act. Next slide, please. This slide shows the four main agricultural areas within the Colorado River Basin region. These irrigated lands had conditional waivers of waste discharge requirements in place to control the waste discharges from agricultural lands. And the Regional Water Board replaced the conditional waivers with general orders that incorporate the precedential requirements of the Eastern San Joaquin order. The Regional Water Board adopted general waste discharge requirements for the Palo Verde and Bard Valleys in 2019, for the Coachella Valley in 2020, and the Imperial Valley in 2021. Next slide, please. Our discussion has focused on the priority programs and projects that are in the Salton Sea watershed. The Regional Water Board also has oversight responsibilities for the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Program, the Water Quality Certificate Program, Land Disposal Program, Waste Discharge Requirements, and Cleanup Programs. All of these programs serve to regulate discharges, assess pollutant concentrations, or clean up pollutants that may impact surface and groundwater resources in the region. They all contribute to efforts to preserve, enhance, and restore the quality of water for current and future generations. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Paula, very much. Um, at this time, uh, let me make clear what the procedural um, pathway to asking questions will be. We'll save them all for the end. Um, so, so jot down your questions or put them in the, in the chat or the Q&A, uh, specifically the Q&A, and we will, we will mine those questions at the end and also there'll be an opportunity to verbally express your question. So thanks again, Paul, and we will move on to the next. And so our second speaker um, is Munjen Lee, um, who is at, at UCLA. Uh, she completed a master's degree in environmental health and environmental management and science uh, from the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon University, respectively. Her PhD is from UCLA, specializing in water resource mitigation strategies um, specifically simulations of the Salton Sea. She is also interested in water policy, environmental justice, and climate change topics, and believes that in order to solve environmental issues and transform the future of the Salton Sea, those aspects need to be incorporated into economic, economically driven decision making. Um, so, um, Anjan, when you're ready, uh, share your screen and start away, start your presentation. Uh, I have a uh, try to navigate my screen. Uh, 
you should have screen sharing capabilities. So if you click on that, then just pick your PowerPoint. Okay. Because I have a double monitor. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm on Jenny. Um, my, are you we're able still, to see my screen? We're not seeing your slides. We're still seeing you. So just click on screen, share screen, and then you'll have a um, a view of your desktop, and you can click on the PowerPoint, which you should have open on your desktop at this point. There you go. That's it. You see my screen? Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Mon Jin Lee. My topic today is special, spatial and temporal trends for contemporary nutrient pollution of the sun and sea. And before we go into that, I'd like to talk about what do we define as nutrient. And in nutrient, we're mainly talking about two elements, nitrogen and phosphorus, because because they naturally have a nutrient cycle in a uh, biogeochemical cycle it's shown here in the picture, in which nitrogen and phosphorus, they are converted into various chemical forms as they circulate throughout atmosphere and terrestrial or aquatic system, except uh, only nitrogen appear in the atmosphere, but phosphorus only mainly exists in terrestrial and aquatic system. Nitrogen is essential for photosynthesis and decomposition of plants and algae and bacteria, where phosphorus is vital components for DNA, RNA, bones, and teeth. And that's why we call them nutrients, because they're building block and essential elements for functioning of the ecosystem. And nutrient become nutrient pollution when, when humans started to add extra excessive nutrient by industrial activity and agricultural activity. So that's when the uh, balance is off and become a pollution problem. Algal bloom as shown in this picture, and you'll hear a lot in the coming uh, uh, presentation, is the result for excessive nutrient got into the aquatic system. Uh, it is also ranked one of the top causes for water resource impairment in the United States. In fact, the survey showed that 40% of rivers, 51% of lakes, and 57% of estuary listed nutrient as primary cause of impairments. And, and to solve this problem, we have to establish what is the standard nutrient concentration. We call it nutrient criteria to solve this problem. And now I wanted to talk about the criteria, the development process to develop this nutrient criteria. There are nine key steps involved in the criteria development process shown in this picture. First of all, the water quality manager develop, defines the water quality needs and goals for the rivers and streams for, for recreational purpose or fishing purpose, etc. And secondly, the rivers and streams are classified so that the criteria developed can be applied to a broader range of water bodies, not just one specific river. And thirdly, the primary water quality parameters that are used to predict the condition of algal bloom are total nitrogen and total phosphorus, as well as algal biomass and turbidity. But in this talk, we're mainly focusing on nitrogen and phosphorus. And on the fourth step, the government will take water samples mentioned previously by Pola, either monthly or quarterly in various locations of the rivers to assess impairment by nutrients and algae. And, and fifth, federal, state, and local water agency all have their water quality database 
In my study, I have compiled them together in order to understand the whole picture of the nutrient pollution. And the sixth step, data analysis allows meaningful interpretation of the monitored data so that we can understand the magnitude and the extent of the algal bloom problems. And that is my role and my study com comes in in this picture. And the seventh step, develop a nutrient level that meet optimum nutrient conditions for aquatic life without creating algal bloom. That is our goal. And for the eighth step, after develop the nutrient criteria, the government will use this criteria into the regulatory actions like permit for wastewater discharge and total daily maximum load TMDL mentioned by Paula previously. And finally, the management activities will continue to be monitored and assessed for the success of the regulatory actions. So this is this is the uh, the picture of all of the sampling sites monitored by various uh, state local agency, and then the largest data come from California Environmental Data Exchange Network, and secondly Bureau of Reclamation, and and also IID. And I also got data from Sandia National Lab. And uh, my, my research group also collects samples along the rivers and where UCLA. And each, each, um, each entity is color coded, but this is a 2D graph. So you, you can only see three colors because, because there are, some of them are duplicates of location. On the left, on the left of this picture, New River consists of treated and partially treated urban runoff, municipal industrial waste, agricultural runoff, and it flows at this solency at a rate of 550 to 700 cubic feet per, sec per second. On the right of this picture is Alamo River. The water is consistently dominated by agricultural runoff from Imperial Valley and, and also treated wastewater. And it runs at a faster rate at 680 to 902 cubic feet per second to the sea. And both of the rivers originate in Mexico. So, so uh, keep in mind that um, Mexico's discharge play a major role in, in this um, water quality of the Solon Sea watershed. So now I wanted to talk about what, what it means for data analysis. For my study, I characterized the data in, in terms of spatial trends and temporal trends. And the benefit to look at spatial, spatial strain is that we can identify location of hotspots. For example, we can clearly identify pollution sources potentially affecting the water quality. And secondly, temporal trends. We can identify seasonal variation for potential sources activity, whether it's making it worse or better from history to, to, to contemporary time. And thirdly, we can evaluate the relationships among related pollutants. Like, for example, dissolved oxygen is another critical parameter that's closely related to nutrient pollution. We'll also look at that. Finally, after we evaluate all of that, we can determine what's critical condition. And that means when and under what condition water impairment occurs. Now let's look at the example of us for spatial and temporal analysis. And that will consist of a 3D graphical analysis. So on the y-axis, this is the temporal trends. From coming to the screen is from history to now, from press to present is coming to the screen. 
and for x axis from left to right is water flowing from Mexico to the Southern Sea. So this direction goes to the Southern Sea. And vertical axis is the concentration. So by looking at the height of the bars, you can know, you can know the uh, magnitude of the concentration. And EPA recommended ambient water quality criteria for nutrient for nitrogen is 0 0.38 milligrams per liter. And keep in mind that they, they picked this number based on the uh, criteria of overprotection. So the, the criteria is very low. And looking at this graph, the right graph is Alamo River from 2002 and 2019. You can see that um, ammonia in uh, Alamo River are somewhat in close range, except in the boundary and, and, and river mouth. Ammonia concentration in New River show decreased trends as it flows to the sea. And if you compare it to the EPA recommended value, you can see that both rivers are way ahead, way above exceeding the uh, threshold values. Now let's look at nitrates. I mean nitrate, let's look at nitrate. That's another form of nitrogen. So nitrate in Alabo River increased in Imperial County region, which is along the river, this middle region. And then it's somewhat close range. Oh, sorry, sorry. It consists, it is somewhat consistent in recent days. Nitrate, con nitrate concentration are somewhat consistent in recent years, except there is this um, outliers back in the 2012, where they have extremely high nitrate concentration coming from, from roughly 20 miles from boundary. Now let's look at nitrate concentration in New River. They remain close range except an outlier at 12 miles from the boundary. Then again, nitrate concentration is also way ahead, way exceeding the uh, threshold value. This is the graph for orthophosphate. That's a form of a phosphorus. And in La Alamo River, you can show an increased strength as they enter the sea. In New River, you can see a decrease trends as they empty into the sea in recent years. But then, but again, all of these concentrations are way exceeding the recommended value, which is at 0 0.02 milligrams per liter. And lastly, let's look at total phosphorus. In Alamo River, we show an increased trends as they enter into the sea in recent years. Also in historic, and in Alamo River, the new river, I'm sorry, in new river, the total phosphorus show a decreased trends in recent years. And lastly, Let's talk about nutrient criteria and how it is critical to define one. Because excessive nutrient concentration, and sorry, the criteria is at this sixth stage of this pre previous process. Uh, excessive nutrient concentration are related to various factors, for example, water body types, climate, and all the cycles I mentioned within the ecosystem. So there's no way the government can develop one single number for the, for the nation. And EPA calculated the threshold value I show as a starting point for state to, to reference, but they use, it, they, they use it at a level that is overprotected criteria. Therefore, California is still in the process of determining the water quality targets for nutrients. And then 
Afterwards, we can formulate an inflammation plant to regulate the nutrient pollution. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manjen. That was excellent. Um, again, we'll save the questions for the end. And Ryan, why don't you go ahead and pull up your slides while I'm introducing you? Our next speaker is Ryan Sinclair. Uh, Ryan is an associate professor of environmental microbiology um, at the Loma Linda University School of Public Health. And he's also an assistant professor in the Department of Earth and Biological Sciences. He completed his PhD on water quality from Tulane University and had a postdoc in environmental microbiology from the University of Arizona. Uh, his work has gone, has not gone without recognition. He was awarded in 2021 the South Coast Air Quality Management District's uh, Robert M. Zeig Clean Air Award. Ryan's gonna to speak to us today on a community science approach to measurement of water quality, the Salton Sea Environmental Time Series. Take it away, Ryan. All right, thanks for that, Tim. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, to be able to speak with everyone about nutrients and water quality monitoring at the Salton Sea. Um, I wanna explain and talk about our community science program and why we're doing it and why we're uh, measuring nutrients. And that's what this presentation is gonna go over. We have a group of community scientists and we call the program, the Salton Sea Environmental Time Series. So first of all, before we kind of explain what, um, who the group is, I wanted to just talk about community science a little bit. It's that process where um, scientists and communities do science together to advance uh, priorities defined by the community. And um, it works to um, use communities guidance, particularly oppressed communities or historically marginalized communities to guide participate in, learn from, and then benefit from science. It's something where we take the, the lead from people in the community and try to respond as best as possible to what the actual concerns are. So um, it's it can differ from the traditional scientific approach where you're either working for an agency or a university going after like say NIH or NSF grants um, and research questions and hypotheses. I try to, of course, integrate those together with community science and community priorities. But um, with the community science approach, you really want to um, integrate what um, the community's priorities are, and then from that, develop appropriate action and policy. Um, so what happened with this um, Alianza Coachella Valley, which is a nonprofit group in the Eastern Coachella Valley that works in the Eastern Coachella Valley, formerly known as um, the Building Healthy Communities. We've had uh, funding from the California Endowment for, for a long time, probably more than a decade in the Building Healthy Communities. And what happened eventually is um, they, they, turned, they changed the name to Alianza in um, about two or three years ago. But we wanted to respond to community members and what the concerns were for water quality and for public health around the Salton Sea. And most community members um, are going to highlight a couple of negatives from the Salton Sea. Those are occurrence of asthma, um, heavy nosebleeds in children, and odor issues, and not to mention um, um, sort of a blight issue and um, negative perceptions around the Salton Sea as well. Um, so we recognized those problems and came to the conclusion that, you know, we needed to um, use a community science approach um, through several meetings and several community forums and things, and that we actually need to measure water quality. So we work with this group called the Thriving Earth Exchange, and they're, um, they're uh, part of the American uh, Geophysical Union. And um, we were able to network and put out a, um, an application or... Um, a, uh, uh, a call for applicants to, to work with us at the Salton Sea. And then, so we were able to recruit Mara, um, Dr. Mara, Dr. Isabella, and Quinn from UCSD and UCI. They're all um, oceanographers and algal specialists, and they're able to work with us as well um, to kind of 
go into the Salton Sea. And that's part of the thriving earth. And that's kind of how we added up our community science team. But then after that, all of us met together and recruited um, community members. And those community members, um, we found that people are really um, interested in the topic of water quality in the Salton Sea. So we had a, actually a pool of about 50 young people, young and old actually, that wanted to um, uh, work with us in the community science program. And so we chose 10 of them and then also added some uh, UCR scientists as well, Carolyn, who's on the call now, and Will Porter. Um, so uh, the methods that we needed to do was, well, first of all, just kind of respond to community concerns and try to make the link. I'll talk more about this later, but making the link between water quality parameters and public health. Um, we went down that road and eventually we determined that our, our, our needs were really, we needed to get out on a boat and do sampling. Um, and that was a bit of a challenge since the Salton Sea had um, receded a lot since the boat ramps were active. So there was no longer a possibility to get on a boat and, and do sampling. Um, we also knew that we needed to measure uh, certain types of water um, quality parameters and that we wanted community members or community members actually wanted to be involved. And also that we wanted data to be easily accessible. So we had all those kind of grand um, objectives to start with and needs. And we're, we are addressing all of those. Um, and then we determined the measurements that we wanted to take were, um, well, for one is to review data that's already there and remote sensing data or satellite data. Also, um, to uh, measure bacteria in the water, like um, Enterococcus and E. coli, also to look at nutrients, um, algae, and then some other items like turbidity and dissolved oxygen. So this is a map um, showing where we're focusing most of our study. We we've been going out and and reviewing this transect here and collecting data on this transect here. Um, this is right at the end of the 84th Avenue and that's a really good boat launch site. And so we go out there, we collect a, um, a transect, actually 84th is this one here. We collect the transect along some agricultural um, canals that empty in. And then we go up to the Whitewater River which actually outflows right here and do a couple more um, sites here to sort of see the um, dispersion of the, the, the nutrients and the different water quality parameters at the mouth of the Whitewater River. And then um, we have this one here, which is the deepest um, point. This one, this one in the middle right here is about um, probably 30 to 35 feet. These points here, this red one and this blue one, these are from the um, Bureau of Reclamation um, water quality sampling sites. And that's relevant for a little bit later. So I have a, um, oops, let me go back to that and try to click on this YouTube video. This is just gonna show you kind of our setup when we're at the Salton Sea. There's our boat there at a kind of a makeshift dock and then we have our vehicles and a tent set up. And the reason I'm showing you this is that for community to be involved in this process, we really had to set up this tables and figure out what methods are possible to run at the Salton Sea that um, you, can, you can do there and complete there without having to go to an analytical lab. So, we wanted to do everything on the shoreline with our nutrient measurements and then our probe um, measurements as well. So uh, the reason for that is because we're bringing community members out and we want people to see the results right away rather than to take them to a lab and then maybe send them the results. So we were pretty, um, pretty diligent about that. And also that um, kind of was part of our selection of, um, let me, uh, get back to this. Part of our selection of um, the different water quality parameters is that we wanted to have those that could be run underneath this this tent here or um, it live out on the boat with a probe. Um, one of the goals we also had was to review satellite data and put that out there. This is just a um, um, an output from some of the satellite data that we've collected. 
about the the water level change. Um, I also have an actual like uh, balloon mapping community science project from a few years ago that measured just maybe this blue section here, but it's pretty important to be reviewing this and also using these kind of um, um, figures to explain to the community what is relevant and why what you're doing is relevant. Um, this is the first nutrient um, plot that we've made just probably less than a week ago. Um, what this shows you here is the um, Bureau of Reclamation data, which is this um, um, site SS1, which is this blue one on the bottom here. And these are like right in the middle of the lake. So if you remember that map I had before, this represents the bottom of the lake. This purple one is in the Whitewater River. And then our group here are the green ones here. So we were measuring nitrite um, plus nitrite milligrams nitrogen per liter. And we were comparing it to those two. And so what I thought was interesting is that, um, you know, a lot of our measurements from community science um, of nitrate plus nitrite seem to be at least slightly higher than what was measured in the Bureau of Reclamation at that mid-lake point. So, um, but not as high as what's in the Whitewater River coming into the lake and due to, um, you know, assimilative capacity and other factors. But it is uh, something to be aware of. And so we're um, still analyzing the data and looking at it, but we put it out there just to, to discuss as well. Um, we also have a uh, sensor that measures algae, and this just sort of gives us a reference for our community members like um, this is a, a graph of most of the lakes in the United States and we're in the top 81st percentile for all of the measurements that we've made at the Salton Sea. Um, and, you know, uh, what I really wanted to get to with data was to actually show you our website that we put up. We put up a, a data dashboard. So let me click on that and it should open. Um, yeah. So this is the, the data dashboard that we have. And we were posting all of this data there just to make it uh, accessible. In the community science approach, you want to make your data accessible um, for community members to use. And so coincidentally, what we had was our community members actually built the website. This wasn't Loma Linda or, or Thriving Earth Exchange. This was actually community members that built this website. So what we have is all of our data shown here. This one is um, showing algae for all those trans, uh, all those sampling points at the mouth of the Whitewater River, um, and you know it's a higher concentration of chlorophyll there. And then you can go here and you can select the different parameters. So we could also do um, uh, phycoerythrin, which is uh, another channel on that same sensor um, that's kind of more specific to um, um, cyanobacteria and you know it also shows much higher results near the uh, mouth of the Whitewater River. We're also able to look at other parameters and see these same uh, trends as we go along there um, like dissolved oxygen and, um, and others but we have all of the data here we also have it all downloadable um, as nutrient data or sensor data. Um, let's see and also it's uh, plotted out here. So you can go to the website, which is um, uh, saltandseascience.org. Uh, when I was just showing you, it was a different website, but we just bought this domain for the, um, for the community science group. So it's an easy to get to domain. So really our next steps here are to, we wanna really align with the Regional Water Quality Control Board and um, start submitting data to Seedin. And we, we might have to, um, rethink some of our approaches for the nutrients that we're measuring because um, a lot of the methods for this to update, um, to be able to upload data to the California state uh, system, uh, the CEDIN, um, you have to use a quality control that might not be able to do it on, um, on the lake. But you know that's something that we're revising now. Um, and then also we wanna align with those TMDLs for nutrients and be able to contribute to the state data because um, it's getting more and more difficult to get into the Salton Sea and we wanna be able to be responsive to that. 
and also share the methods that we're using and the lessons that we learned. We've also worked a lot with UCR and the, the, the different groups there. Um, but overall, what we're trying to do with everyone is to try to establish that link between public health and nutrients. It's um, not easy. There's not a, a lot of research on this either. Um, people, of course, are trying to do it, but to try to get this um, idea that uh, eutrophication and hyper eutrophication that happened in the Salton Sea, and how can that actually be linked up with um, public health complaints like uh, asthma, for instance. There are um, hypothesized pathways there, but we we're trying to stay on top of that and responsive to that as well. So that's what I have for the presentation. And I guess I will take questions afterwards. Perfect, Ryan. Thank you very, very much. And yes, we will save questions for the end. Um, so Caroline, why don't you go ahead and pull up your talk while I start the introduction. So just to give you a bit of a recap, um, we've been following the nutrients and we've been talking about um, the flow of the nutrients down the rivers and, uh, and their sources within the agricultural regions in particular. And Ryan discussed with us the levels within the lake and how they're measured and how they've changed and what they might mean. And now Caroline is gonna take that theme of, of what they might mean and talk about some of the chemical and associated ecological consequences. So Caroline Hung is a PhD student um, at the University of California, Riverside. She's a third year student in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. She studies the biogeochemistry of the salt and sea, uh, which involves this work involves monitoring water quality and characterizing trace metal composition of the bottom sediments. Her field work and lab analyses have public health implications for seasonal sulfide release events and dust related pulmonary issues in the region. Throughout her work, she thinks a lot about science communication to come up with innovative and effective ways to increase awareness and inform policy associated with salt and sea management. She is going to speak on something that I alluded to in the beginning, a little, uh, I would say a less known aspect of the human consequences in the salt and sea and that's decreasing oxygen contents. So she will speak on seasonal oxygen depletion in the salt and sea effects on water quality through trace metal and sulfur cycling. Caroline. All right, thanks, Tim. Um, hope everyone can hear me. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so we often hear about how there's no oxygen sometimes in the salt and sea. So I want to break down today why there is no oxygen in the salt and sea and then how that affects our water quality. Uh, let's see. Head. Oops. Uh, yeah, so my name is Caroline Hall. I'm a doctoral student. And I just want to point out that um, most of my work at the Salt Sea is in collaboration with Charlie, which is our who is our postdoc in our lab, and he also contributed a lot to the presentation today, uh, with along with the figure making. Um, so he'll be part of the panel later as well. Um, so just letting you guys know, um, so there are a couple of takeaways I would um, like to present now um, to you. Uh, first of all, I want to think about the definition when we say water quality. Um, a lot of times when we think about restoration project, we say maybe there's not enough water or a water supply that can go back into the salt sea and therefore we can't do anything. Um, water quality is actually related to what Ryan and Minchin talked about in terms of nutrients and how that affects the water column, right? Um, so that's an important piece to like pull apart. Um, I wanted to uh, answer what does it mean when people, you, you hear people say the salt and sea water is toxic. And I also wanted to expand a little bit more on the cause of oxygen depletion that was mentioned by Men Chen, which was cultural eutrophication. And then from there, what is the effect um, of oxygen depletion um, on trace met metal behavior in the salt and sea, as well as the sulfur cycling? Um, so sulfur is this element that you um, may have sm smell from the salt sea, uh, and it smells like rotten eggs, that's sulfide. And I'll talk a, a lot more about it in my presentation. Um, so first of all, um, I need to talk about the carbon cycle at the salt sea in order to kind of introduce you to the problem. Um, so all living things are made of carbon and carbon moves through the air, the water, as well as the soil in different forms. In the atmosphere, carbon is uh, in the form of carbon dioxide. So basically when algae or marine plants in the salt and sea, what they do to create energy is they use sunlight and they use this carbon dioxide. Um, and that is a process we call photosynthesis. 
And what they create is oxygen and as well as energy in the form of sugar. And when algae dies, um, it becomes um, organic matter. And this, this organic matter is then uh, consumed by uh, bacteria. Sorry, there's an extra thing over here. Um, and so what I wanna show you right now is um, what we get from going out on a winter day on the salt and sea water. So here's me and um, our master student, Ali, um, on the boat sampling water. Um, you can see here that, oh, also first off, when, when, when I say water column, I mean the entirety of the water um, of the salt and sea. So that's about 12 meters deep. So if you think about it, it's like stacking six Kobe Bryans uh, on top of each other. And that's not very deep for a lake as big as the Salton Sea. Um, and so what we get here is temperature, um, con temperature dissolved oxygen and oxidation reduction potential of the water column on a winter day. That's December 13, 2020. You see that most of the water is at 16 degrees Celsius. And so uh, that's not, that's pretty, like that's below room temperature. So um, photosynthesis and respiration is happening in a balanced state. Um, and so the entire water column that you see here is actually oxygenated. So percent dissolved oxygen, 100, more or less suboxic, 100% DO throughout the water column. Um, and now fast forward uh, to June 18th, a couple months after uh, the, the winter sampling date in 2021. And you see that this temperature of the surface water of the salt and sea started to increase. Now that is uh, around 30, 33 degrees. So in terms of Fahrenheit, that is around 90. So if you take a hot shower, right, that's about the same temperature. So imagine going salt sea water at this time of the year, it feels pretty warm. And so temperature is a driver of uh, photosynthesis and restoration. And so we started to see, you know, perhaps uh, bacteria started to speed that process up. And so I want to remind everyone that we have a lot of nutrients flowing into the salt sea due to agricultural wastewater input, what uh, Mencha and Ryan had talked about. Um, so this fertilizer. So we use fertilizer on farms, right, to help uh, plants grow. So imagine what that will be like um, when you put full fertilizers into the salt sea. That will drive um, the algae to grow super fast. And so when the algae dies, become organic matter, uh, and then bacteria consume it in this process of respiration. Along with it, it consumes this oxygen that was produced. So um, this is a phenomenon called cultural eutrophication, when nutrients level at the salt sea is too high from the inflow of ag, ag water, um, algae growth is accelerated, and this leads to harmful algal blooms as well as the depletion um, of oxygen. So here we actually see that um, phenomenon happening in real time. Again, that's the same day, June 18th of 2021. This is the salt, salty water column. So we sampled three sites, right? We, we launched from the south, went, went across to the deepest point, And we see that even though oxygen is super saturated in the very surface because uh, photosynthesis is happening so fast, um, this oxygen is immediately consumed. And so this is around like three meters deep. Three meters is only what? one and a half Kobe Bryant's, and then you already see uh, no oxygen, zero. And so that the entirety of the salt sea is pretty um, dra drastic in the sense that there is no oxygen in this water column. And what do we think about in terms of ecological impacts? Um, the fish dies, uh, no oxygen. That's as much as related to the high salinity issue, right? Um, and so when we say the salt sea is toxic, um, I think most of the time, the state water board means that there's harmful algal blooms going on um, because uh, harmful algal blooms are usually um, the, the accelerated growth um, of, of um, algae. So to produce toxic or harmful, harmful uh, substances that can actually be very fatal if you consume it. So this dog drank the water and died. Um, so this is kind of what it looks like. If you've seen this green mat, micro microbial mat, it's a cyanobacteria, and it's a harmful algal bloom in the salt and sea. Uh, so this photo was taken from the southern shoreline. Um, so uh, other than harmful algal blooms, um, what happens when there is no oxygen in the salt and sea water column? So I want to look at it in the perspective of um, trace metals. So when you think about trace metals, these are metals. Uh, example, iron, iron, if you see iron oxidized, um, you will see like in, on your bike and there's like rust that's oxidized iron. 
Um, I also want to talk about sulfur cycling. And sulfur is uh, an element that is cycled through and produced in a water column very efficiently when there is no oxygen. And that's a very important um, process in the salt sea. Um, so I want to kind of show you some of our data we have gathered over the last years. Um, 2021, August 24th, we sampled the water from the salt sea, and then we measured the trace metal contents um, of, of this water. So in this, um, uh, in this number listed below, it's actually the EPA drinking water standard. And you can see that most of the trace element or all of the trace element are actually well below this EPA drinking water standard. So that means if you actually take a cup of salty water and try to drink it, you'll probably be fine other than that it's very, very salty. Um, but when we talk about that, uh, my next speak, our next speaker will talk more about selen selenium and probably bioaccumulation is the idea that, you know, if you have a water boatman or a bug living in the salt sea, they're consuming this selenium, right? And then a bird came by and it's very hungry and it consumes about 700 of these little bugs. This is about the number of bugs they will eat in one day. Um, that's bioaccumulation. It will actually end up consuming a lot of selenium. because you see that build up um, is quite um, bad. Um, however, I want to point out that actually, because the salt and sea bottom sediments are um, anoxic most of the time, it's actually very effective in sequestering these um, tr trace metals um, in, in its anoxic state. But also you can think of it in terms of just simple gravity drawdown of this trace metal accumulating over time. Um, so we can see that even though we don't have a lot of trace metal in the salt and sea water, we do have uh, quite a bit more in magnitude of the trace elements that we're concerned about. Um, and so our, our lab is actively going out to the salt sea, collecting sediment and trying to understand more um, where these concentrated um, elements are, right? And so this is from a previous study in 2002. And you can see that selenium concentrations, uh, while the darker blue shows the most concentrated regions are in the middle. And um, you can also see that the, these regions are near the um, communities of desert shores and salt city. city. So we can't just say that, oh, if the middle of the lake is kept wet, we'll be okay. Um, these shorelines will probably dry up in the next couple of years, right? And so what that will mean is probably a dust problem because the sediment is gonna get exposed and the wind will be training this dust and picking up, transporting it. Um, same for molybdenum. In this study, there's a couple more other trace metals that were talked about. So you can definitely go and take a look. But we are trying to build this in um, higher resol resolution, these maps. Um, I also want to quickly touch on the sulfur cycle in terms of oxidation re uh, reduction potential. Simply put, it's the ability for microbes to use oxygen to produce energy, right? And so when ORP, I'll say it, ORP is positive, uh, you can, oxygen is available as an electron acceptor. When ORP is negative, though, that means there is no oxygen. So on a June 18th, uh, 2021, that day we talked about where there was no oxygen in the surface water, um, you can actually see that ORP dropped along with it and it became native around uh, four meters down and um, it actually reaches negative 200, which is actually the um, millivolt value for sulfate reduction. So I'm going to explain kind of what that means. Um, sulfate in the salt sea is very, very abundant. It's 400 millimolar and that is about 10 times that of the modern ocean. And we know that there's a uh, high sulfate in salt and sea also because of fertilizer input, because ammonium sulfate is a common fertilizer used. Um, and so sulfate is used as the electron acceptor um, in place of oxygen. So that is where microbes use the energy anaerobically without oxygen to provide, to provide energy. And the product of that is sulfide. And so you can see that sulfide increased a lot um, in salt and sea bottom waters. And so when we go out to sample and we collect the water, pumped water from the deep, uh, we can actually smell the sulfide when we pump this water up and collect it in our sample vials. So imagine what it will be like, which happens often in the lake when the water overturns and get mixed. Um, this sulfide is actually emitted into the atmosphere. And that is why people say the salt sea smell bad. It's the emission of the sulfide. It smells like rotten eggs or, or like a marsh. Um, and so the South Coast Air Quality Monitoring District actually monitors this, so you can have quantitative data um, every single day in real time, hourly, to know um, the sulfide emissions from the lake. Um, these monitors are 
assembled in the near shore and Mexico community sites uh, as well as Indio. I think that one will come up um, sometimes. I think it's a little broken now, but uh, I grabbed a screenshot from yesterday evening. Um, so I encourage you to all go to the link and sign up because in the summertime, you will see that often in the evenings, the sulfide emission levels increase the 30 ppb um, state standard. Um, and so that is the hydrogen sulfide that works. So um, I produced this kind of concept diagram to summarize. So we would start from nutrients, right? We increase in nutrients and then you lead to algal blooms, decay of organic matter, and that um, leads to the consumption of oxygen in the water column, which means no oxygen in the water column in the summer times. There's ecology, ecological die-off um, of fish, but also what will happen, trace metal to sink into the sediments and create future dust hazard in terms of toxicity, and also with the sulfide production, uh, like smells back. But if you decrease the nutrient, which is what I'm trying to do, actually, uh, this flow chart uh, will, you know, it, these kind of problems might go away. And so what we know about nutrients residence times is that, you know, a lot of abundance of nutrients can actually be used up in a lake like the Salton Sea in one or two years. So say we have policy um, that controls or limits the amount of nutrients input into the lake, um, we can actually have a possibility at cleaning up the lake, um, the water quality. So um, a lot of times we get questions like, what are we doing right now in terms of research and monitoring that we're not already doing before or in the slew of great papers that came out in the early 2000s? Um, I would say that uh, cultural eutrophication really wasn't mentioned a lot, like both what mentioned Ryan had said, uh, not a lot of studies were done in the Salton Sea, even though it's a widely known issue in most of the Great Lakes um, around the country. Um, and we introduced a seasonal aspect to it such that you know, if you go out, say the bureau go out to measure water column of the salt and sea in the winter times, it might be oxic, right? But if you go in the summer, it'll be completely anoxic. You'll see a different, completely signal, completely different signal. So it's very important to monitor the lake over the seasons. Um, we also synthesize biogeochemical cycling. So we're thinking of nutrients, we're thinking of trace metals in the water and sediments. We're also thinking of sulfur, right? Um, and we're not saying that because we don't have water supply, we can't do anything to clean up the water column of the Salton Sea. Um, so uh, just kind of want to wrap up here. Uh, feel free to contact us questions. Obviously the panel, uh, we have Q&A, but also I want to say that um, a lot of scientific research on the Salton Sea is done at UCR through the Salton Sea Task Force, a lot of great scientists. Um, and so we published this report if you want to check it out feel free to check out the Salty Task Force website. So I'll drop some of these links in the chat later. Thanks. Thank you, Caroline. That was great. Um, and we will move last, but certainly not least, to our final talk. Susan, maybe pull your talk up while I'm introducing you. Uh, our next speaker is Susan uh, De La Cruz, who is a research wildlife biologist uh, with the USGS Western e Ecological Research Center um, and the San Francisco Bay Estuary at the at the San Francisco Bay Estuary Field Station. Uh, Susan earned a, a BS in biology from UC Davis, an MS in wildlife and fisheries science from Texas A and M University, and a PhD uh, in ecology, emphasizing ecotoxicology from UC Davis. Uh, she is a research wildlife biologist, again, at the USGS Western Ecological Research Center. She has a background in avian, avian ecology and ecotoxicology. Her research links experimental field studies with statistical and geospatial modeling to evaluate threats and restoration benefits to migratory birds, their estuarine habitats, and their food resources. She has adopted a, a flyway wide perspective with the ultimate goal of identifying novel cross-sectional approaches to conserving water birds through their ranges and annual cycles. She conducts multifaceted projects that include non-avian taxes such as native fish species whose habitat and trophic needs overlap with those of the birds to provide conservation solutions to multi-species habitat management in the face of shrinking resources. She will speak with that vast amount of um, research that she's doing, she will narrow that down and speak today on selenium dynamics in the Salton Sea environment, improving ecosystem scale models and addressing management needs in emerging wetlands. Susan. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a 
a very nice and long introduction. Um, I appreciate that. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for sticking around for the last talk of the day. Um, today, I wanted to just briefly introduce you to a study that we've started to look at selenium hazards for wildlife in the wetlands that are along the perimeter of the Salton Sea. Um, so this is work that I'm conducting with my colleagues, Isa Wu, who's also with the USGS Western Ecological Research Center, and Krishwangi Groover, who's with the California Water Science Center. Um, it's currently funded by the Bureau of Reclamation and USGS, and we're working closely with other partners from USGS, um, from Fish and Wildlife Service, from Cal Fish and Wildlife and Department of Water Resources, and many others to try to implement um, this work and, and to plan it out. Um, so the modern Salton Sea, as you've heard already today, is a shallow landlocked saline lake that's sustained by irrigation return and then perennial river inflow. And the lake is surrounded by areas that are critical migratory and wintering areas for over 450 species of Pacific flyway water birds. Um, and uh, that includes habitat for federal and state listed endangered and threatened species like the desert pupfish, um, California black rail, Yuma Ridgeways rail, and others. Um, and as we know, due to recent agreements to redistribute water and increase irrigation efficiency, agricultural runoff that's feeding the sea has declined dramatically. And as the lake level drops, um, the drains and canals and streams that no longer reach the lake are just charging their water onto exposed lake bed sediments um, and forming wetlands in areas that were previously underwater. Um, so these emerging wetlands provide habitat for invertebrates, fish, and birds. Um, however, they also pose potentially risks for wildlife because of the legacy of selenium contamination in the region. And you've heard a little bit about this already from Caroline, but um, selenium is naturally, it's a naturally occurring element in the soils of the Western United States, um, but it can be mobilized by farming irrigation practices and other actions um, that lead to high concentrations um, in agricultural drain water. Um, so selenium can accumulate in wildlife uh, that use these wetlands like the Yuma rail um, and blackneck stilts and others. Um, and selenium has a, what's called a biphasic dose response in animals. And that means that in low amounts, it has a beneficial effect in you and I and all the animals in the wetland do need small amounts of selenium. But at a high dose, it has an inhibitory or toxic effect. Um, and in particular, it impacts the hatching of eggs and also the development and early life stages of birds and fish. So that's why it's a hazard and something that we need to look out for. So to help understand selenium hazard um, posed by these newly forming wetlands, um, the Bureau of Reclamation and USGS funded a synthesis study um, to synthesize existing selenium data from the Salton Sea. Um, so this is a, gonna be a scientific investigations report and it's due out early this summer. And basically it summarizes all the available disparate selenium information collected on water, sediment and biota in the region since about the 1980s um, to identify data caps that need to be filled to understand potential effects of selenium on species of concern. Um, so through the synthesis, we have discovered a number of data gaps that I'm not gonna go through here, um, but the current gap that we're addressing through this study is the need for improved wetland specific information on selenium biogeochemistry and uptake into food webs um, to inform models that can tell us what the risk is for the different species in these wetlands. And the results of these models can be used as kind of decision support tools to help managers understand and manage risks for wildlife. Uh, so fortunately for me, there is already a very good framework for modeling selenium hazards to wildlife. 
Um, and this was developed in a 2010 paper and you know many papers leading up to this one. Uh, by Teresa Presser and Sam Luoma, and it's called um, an ecosystem scale selenium modeling approach. And the idea here is that selenium concentrations in wildlife are influenced by a number of processes. And those processes are can be very site specific and depend on the biogeochemistry of the site and on the plants and animals that inhabit that site. Um, so important components of the model methodology are uh, first determining the sources and selenium concentration in water on the site. Um, then understanding the dis different forms of selenium in the water, because that in turn influences what gets taken up into the plants, algae, and bacteria at the site. Um, and then measuring concentrations of selenium in kind of the, the living and non-living particulates at the base of the food web. So not only the algae and the bacteria, but also the things that are dead, the detritus there, um, because that determines what selenium is available for invertebrates to eat. Um, fourth, we want to determine what are uh, called biodynamic food web or trophic transfer factors that quantify the potential for selenium to bioaccumulate from prey to predator. And finally, we want to relate this bioaccumulated selenium concentrations um, in predators to toxic effects like deformities and the reproductive uh, failure that I talked about earlier that can lead to effects on populations. So there have been previous efforts to use an ecosystem scale uh, approach at the Salton Sea. You might be familiar with the Species Conservation Habitat Project, um, which the state's implementing in the south end of the sea. And for this project, there was extensive work done to model uh, ecosystem selenium risk for um, fish and for fish eating birds um, that would use the type of habitat that's planned to be created, more of a deep water and vegetated habitat. Um, and based on this modeling, the state decided on management actions that keep the water salinity high enough to minimize or eliminate vegetation at the site and also to make the selenium less bioavailable for fish and fish eating birds much like Caroline was explaining in her talk earlier. Um, however, uh, for the habitats that we're interested in, these vegetated uh, shallow wetlands, these management options may not be available um, because we want that emergent vegetation to support the rails and other birds that need to use the habitat and also the food that they eat. Um, some recent studies at managed and unmanaged sites have evaluated selenium in water and sediment and some of the foods that um, birds eat at these sites. Um, here's just some results from a very recent uh, publication by Mark Rika and others. Um, and they found that um, selenium, and this is looking at selenium in uh, head and body feathers of Yuma rails, um, were elevated above concentrations that could cause effects in some species, particularly at these unmanaged sites. So sites that are receiving just drain water and not um, water from um, other places, or not water from um, the Colorado River, which is typically um, uh, has less selenium in it. So this study also had a telemetry component, um, which you can see here, that demonstrated that rails are restricted to small home ranges in emergent vegetation, um, unless the selenium concentrations that we see here are likely directly reflective of the food web processes and the local biogeochemicals that are going on right there where the rail um, is located. The study highlights the potential hazards of selenium concentrations for rails in managed and unmanaged marshes. And you can see here oh, that some birds in managed marshes also had concentrations that were above buckets. Um, so there's still a lot of information needed to properly apply selenium modeling to um, vegetated wetlands. And that 
Information includes um, understanding hydrology and residence times of these sites, um, improve understanding of geochemical factors, um, influencing selenium speciation or what form of selenium is in the water and the sediments. Uh, we also need to know, understand the rates of selenium bioconcentration, that is like how much selenium is coming from the water and concentrating in algae and bacteria that's at the base of the food web. Um, we need to understand food web structures for different birds using the sites. Um, and then habitat use and foraging areas of the birds and the sites, because this determines where and how much selenium they accumulate. Um, and lastly, we still don't understand sensitivity uh, for some species uh, like the Yuma rail. So lack of all this information really precludes an ecosystem scale modeling needed to fully understand selenium hazards at wetlands. So um, that leads to our current study, which sets out to fill some of these information needs so we can refine these selenium models. And here we're taking a phased approach in which each phase kind of builds on the last and the, the information one from one phase will inform the next. Uh, so in phase one, which is ongoing, uh, we worked with resource managers and other partners to determine their priority management needs and to identify managed and unmanaged sites that were fed by a range of water sources, drain, river, groundwater, um, and even sea, uh, among which we could compare selenium and food web uh, processes. Um, and then under phase two, we're gonna be implementing studies that are aimed at understanding selenium processes <clears throat> at these sites. And in phase three, we'll wrap it up um, to identify um, sensitive taxa for long-term monitoring, um, populate these predictive selenium risk models, and then finally, hopefully create, you know, um, testable management regimes that might inform, um, inform managers at these sites about how to lower risks for, um, for, for the wildlife using them. Um, so as I said, phase one is nearing completion. We've coordinated with um, stakeholders from several federal um, and state agencies and NGOs. Uh, we're also working with uh, Courtney Conway and Sydney Yost from um, USGS uh, um, Cooperative Research Center at the University of Idaho. Uh, they're studying humor rail movements and uh, together with them, we sampled water, sediment and plants uh, to look at selenium at a range of sites um, that they're using. Um, so these are the sites that we're considering for the study uh, uh, and where we collected uh, uh, the information that um, I discussed. Uh, we have 15 different sites right now that we're thinking about with a range of uh, known water sources. Um, so we're just starting phase two of our study, and this is going to be very heavy on data collection. Uh, we'll be implementing several of the study components um, to try to get to specific information that I mentioned is needed for the ecosystem modeling. Um, here, we're trying to understand how various sources of water and site-specific chemical characteristics in the water and sediment can influence how much is taken up into plants and invertebrates at the base of the food web. Um, so while the Colorado River is a source of water to many managed wetlands, unmanaged playa wetlands get water from drains as well as water from geothermal sources um, and groundwater discharge. And water from each of these sources have specific chemistry that can influence what form of selenium is in it and how much is available to the food web. So we're measuring uh, water chemistry and forms of selenium in the water, sediment, decaying organic material, algae, cattail. And we're also caging invertebrates on site to understand accumulation at the sites right there. And then we'll use these data to calculate partitioning coefficients or KD, which is going to tell us how much selenium is moving from the water into the food web. 
Um, also in phase two, we'll be conducting studies to refine our understanding of food web structure or who eats who in the salt and sea wetlands. Um, so in order to model how much selenium a predator might accumulate, you have to understand what it's eating and in what proportions. So we're using a variety of tools there, including stable isotopes, dietary DNA, and traditional diet sampling um, to try to get at that information. And then we'll use that to refine these trophic transfer factors and bioaccumulation models. Other information we'll be using is uh, movement and habitat use data on species for which we want to understand risk uh, because this determines where and when they're exposed to selenium. So in this case, we're lucky to have the work of Courtney Conway and Sydney Yost to uh, give us a little more information on um, use of uh, by rails. And then we're also interested in looking at black nut stilts since they're a species that's uh, relatively sensitive to selenium. Um, and lastly, we'll need information on how selenium concentrations that we see in these taxa are, are translating to reproductive effects in wetland species. Um, in the case of the black neck stilt, their sensitivity is really well known and established and we can use what we find in salt and sea to compare to other sites to understand the relative risks at salt and sea um, compared to other places. Uh, but for rails, we're not so sure how sensitive they are to selenium. Um, they may be more adapted to this environment and less sensitive to selenium. So that's work that we hope to do with Courtney and, and Sydney to help us to better understand this. And then, like I said, in phase three, uh, which is scheduled for 24, 2024 and 25, we'll be putting all these results together from the phase two study to do selenium modeling and hopefully working with managers to identify some strategies um, that might help them lower selenium risks that we might find for wetland wildlife. And you know, we're trying to move along. So I just want to thank you all for listening and a special thanks to our funders and to all the folks that have collaborated with us so far. Thanks. Thank you very much, Susan. So that brings us to the end of our um, five distinguished speakers. And Mike, I guess I need to know from you um, where our hard stop is. Do you want to do some Q&A now, even though we're running a bit late? Uh, I, well, it depends on the panelists' availability, but I'm, we have some additional time available. So if there are questions, we can answer them live. Uh, and then people can also follow up uh, with written questions or email questions to me, and I can pass them along to the panelists as well. I have a, a hard stop in about a half an hour because I have to get ready for a class, but I can certainly stick around. And I, um, how about the other panelists? Are you able to, to stay? Yeah? yeah. Okay. Well, why don't we go ahead and start? Oh, and go ahead, sorry. Paula, is that stay. you? I can stay for a little bit. But okay, great. About two. So if, if Paula may have a shorter fuse than others, so if there are any questions specifically for Paula, let's start with that. Um, so I, as moderator, have jotted down a lot of questions, but I want to turn it over to everyone else before I start going through that archive. And um, the first thing I can do is look in the chat. Um, so I don't see any questions there. Um, I encourage folks to ask their questions uh, verbally. They should be able to unmute themselves. Is that right, Mike or Bob? Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's right. There was one question that was posed in the Q&A. Uh, general response is, uh, this webinar is being recorded. It'll be posted on the Pacific Institute website. Uh, and I think if uh, some of the panelists are willing to share their individual presentations, we can probably do that as well. Perfect. Great. I'll wait another minute, or not minute, but a few seconds for questions. And certainly other panelists can ask questions of other panelists. Um, um, should I break the ice? Um, I'll go ahead and do that. So Paula, um, I may be putting you on the spot a little bit with this, and this might be a little bit outside your purview, but you talked among the many strategies um, and monitoring efforts that are 
part of a very large effort about dust suppression. And of course, we know something about dust suppression in, in Owens Lake. I wonder if you could talk just a little bit about that conversation for the Salton Sea. Uh, Salton Sea, is, is, of course, is different because it's so large relative to Owens. Um, so are there strategies in place, uh, not in, uh, or at least conversations happening in this regard that you can share? Actually, you're right. It is a little bit outside of my wheelbase. And I don't know that I really can other than the dust suppression efforts that are ongoing by the Natural Resources Agency as part of those projects that we talked about earlier, um, in terms of you know how they are are addressing them and, and working through them. Can I ask a very general question about that? And again, it might be asking too much, but let me try. So uh, much of the conversation is about what portion of the salt and sea you keep wet um, by the different water management strategies. And, and our group thinks about that in terms of variations, heterogeneities and pesticide abundance and metals and so forth in those sediments. And there is there sort of an optimal, if everything's not gonna stay wet, are there certain areas that would be worth prioritizing to keep wet? But are there other strategies such as in Owens Lake where it's spraying, keeping things wet, not perennially underwater, but just keeping them damp? You know, I, I really hesitate to kind of jump okay. into that area because it, it, it again, it is sort of outside of what we're focused on. I'll, I'll be excited that, to hear. Go ahead, sorry. So that does tie in nicely to a future webinar we're going to have on specifically about air quality and, and dust suppression. So we'll we'll dig into that quite a bit. Okay. Um, yes. There is a question in the Q and A uh, about the. The question is, what is the basis for determining the nutrient standards are overprotected for the Salton Sea? And does the regional board agree? So that might be, um, uh, maybe. Yeah, it, no. yeah let, let, me, um, let me have Emma pipe up a little bit about how we do standards development. Because, you know, in terms of who says if it's overprotected or, or not, that really gets into our development process for our water quality plans, the TMDLs. Yeah, that is much more my wheelhouse. Um, so basically, that is very much an opinion over protective versus not. Um, the way the regional board determines what water quality objectives get used is really back to the beneficial uses. So what is that water body doing? Are people recreating? Are they fishing? Are they just, you know, looking at it? All of those things go into how protective we need to be with our standards. And it's not necessarily, I believe one of the um, other presenters spoke to the fact that you can't have just one standard for everything. And so that is part of our approach to the salt and sea watershed. We are probably going to have to develop site-specific objectives just because it is a unique system. It's not like any other lake in California. So we're probably going to have to take those all those beneficial uses into consideration. And even part of that is reviewing which beneficial uses were are assigned for the Salton Sea as well. So that is on our docket for the next few years to kind of figure out, you know, what are we doing? What do we need to protect and what water quality objectives are going to get us there? Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I don't see any in the Q&A. Uh, I would just like to make a comment. Um, I, I found the information that was shared today really very insightful and I would like to make sure that the presenters are willing to share their data and their analysis with the water board as we look at standards development going forward. Yes. Yeah, maybe on that note, making a quick comment. Um, so thinking about the salt and sea, even though perhaps it's not uh, recommended that people do any like leisure activity on it, um, with the sulfide release events, that does directly affect um, the quality of life in, on the shore. So like definitely take that into account um, when thinking about uh, cultural eutrophication and nutrient management um, solutions. Well, as I said, I have a, I have a question for each of you, but, but I see Ryan's hand go up. So I'm gonna to defer to others in every case. Go Ryan. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, I was just thinking about um, um, some of the some of the issues with with nutrients on the salt and sea and um, and uh, eventually uploading the data to the seed in the California um, uh, database. Uh, I forget the acronym, what it stands for, but it's the California database that the Water Board and the Colorado River Regional Water Quality Board have to, that's when data gets in there, then you can make decisions based on it. Um, so one of the biggest challenges for us would be uh, you know, just getting that quality assurance project plan going for our research-based data. And um, just wondering, you know, maybe Emma or, or Paula, you know, we can work with you to have you review some drafts of that um, in the future. Because we would like to get to the point where we can upload data to, to that website. Yeah, that, that would be ideal. Emma, do you know the process for seeding QAQC? I don't, I haven't gone through it myself before, um, but I do know that the CEDIN help desk and everything is very responsive. Um, so if you have issues, but I'm more than happy to help facilitate if necessary, because yeah, you guys are doing really great work that would really enhance what we're doing. Yeah, and to, oh, and to contribute that to um, the TMDL somehow, um, you know, just to see the development of that TMDL come out. Yeah, that, that would be great. I mean, the data, that's um, the fact that you're willing to get it into seed and, and to give us access to it, I think it'd be very beneficial. Absolutely. Thanks. Let me follow on that really uh, quickly. This seems like such an important point that is relevant for all of us. Ryan, I'm, this is a question to you. I'm wondering specifically um, your sense of obligation to publish your results and this comes up in many different kinds of research projects that my group is involved with. Um, do you have a bit of a moratorium where you want to get your results submitted at least before you post them for public access or how, how are you playing that? Uh, well, that's, that's a good question with, um, with um, this project because one of the mandates of our community science approach is that the data becomes immediately available I mean, maybe a little bit of polishing, you know, take some um, significant figures off or something and make sure that, uh, you know, we aren't, we're not reporting, um, you know, uh, invalid data, but we want to, we want to get it out as soon as possible. So that's why we have that website up to just have the data released out there. And if publications come out, um, those can come out after the data is, is given and released to the community out there. Um, so uh, on this, there's no moratorium and Currently, we're not exactly funded by any agency, so we're just, we don't have a moratorium. Except for Alianza, I should mention Alianza is funding some parts of our, our community science project. Thank you. Mike, is your hand up intentionally? Yes. Yes. So my question is really for all the panelists. Um, so given the uh, reduction in, in the size or the volume of the salt and sea, uh, and some changes in total loadings. But I think the rate of loadings is not decreasing at the same rate as the volume of the salt and sea is changing. And Caroline mentioned a little bit that if you can reduce the source, uh, source loadings, then you'll see some benefits from the salt and sea, but that seems to be going the opposite direction. So I'm wondering if uh, the panelists can speculate um, or estimate or use your best knowledge to. Um, project what it might, what the salt and sea might look like in the next five, 10, 15 years based on uh, more or less uh, constant loadings uh, and a much smaller volume of water in which uh, um, that might dissolve or, or be distributed. Um, so I, I am I, uh, my PhD dissertation, I use a hydrodynamics and water quality model to simulate various mitigation strategy for the salt and sea. And then based on my analysis, there are already enough nutrients in the water column to, to, to generate algal blooms periodically in the sea itself. So so reducing the, the, the amount of water reduced entering the sea will not, will not, um, 
improve the water quality of the sea too much. I don't, I don't believe so. But, um, but I, I think it will benefit if we make effort to um, accumulate pollutants down in the sediment so that it wouldn't be resistant much to affect the water column. That will be helpful to improve the water quality of the sea. Caroline, I see your hand up, but let me, while the point is being made, let me follow up with, with Meng Jen quickly. So this is a really interesting point. So my group thinks a lot about the seasonal blooms in the Salton Sea. And, you know, we think about that in the framework of a lot of different, particularly marine systems that we work in, but the Salton Sea is so eutrophic. There is such a large nutrient load in the Salton Sea already you could ask yourself why there are seasonal blooms. Um, and you know, the natural response would be because it's warmer and the algae like warmer temperatures, but it's pretty much always warm down there. So do you have feelings for why there are seasonal blooms? It's a very basic question. You know, one possibility is that there's more agricultural runoff and, and more associated fertilizer with that. Um, but as you said, there's so much nutrient in the, in the system already. Why are we getting those? So the, the algae when they die um they can also release phosphorus out into the water column so they they also are part of the source of nutrient in the sea sure but that's sure and that's why the waters are going anoxic in the summer because of the decay and the associated release of phosphorus and nitrogen i'm just asking specifically why in the surface waters of the salton sea are there summer algal blooms Again, the logical response would be that it's warmer at that time, mm -hmm. um, but it's always warm. So I'm wondering in the face of such high nutrient availability, why we see a seasonal pattern. Seasonal Ryan, are you asking a question, Lauren, or are you gonna to respond to this as well? I'm not sure, but go ahead, Monk, Monk Chen, go ahead. I, I have one last comment. So the Salton Sea is a heavily wind-driven uh, aquatic system. And then the pr predominant wind is probably southwestern wind. So it, it'll generate a uh, counterclockwise gyra and that will stir up, stir up the water column really nicely to, to uh, uh, re, re suspend it, the nutrient down in the bottom. So, so when you see seasonal bloom, it'll, it'll um, most likely relevant associated with wind patterns. So it's a kind of upwelling is what you're saying, basically recycling dissolved nutrient in the deeper waters. Re reducing nutrient in the uh, tributary river is definitely still very essential in the long term. Caroline, you had your hand up. Oh, yeah, I just want to clarify when I say reduce nutrient, um, I don't mean like reduce water flow. Uh, I mean some sort of sewage treatment to just remove the nutrients and not um, the water. Um, and kind of thinking about Tim's question, um, there is a thermal climb built up in the summer. Um, that's pretty extreme in terms of surface water versus downward. So you see a pattern versus in the winter, there's no thermal climb. So thinking more about why there's, um, I guess, anoxic events more in the summer. But that's all I want to say. Yeah. Ryan. Oh, from our, our limited data, we, we went out um, several times from June 2021 through um, March 2022. And, uh, you know, it's, I, don't, I don't have an answer to the, um, the, the seasonal bit about algal blooms, but measuring algae on the optical sensor up near the mouth of the Whitewater River is pretty consistent throughout the year. It's pretty much always high there. So that's like, I don't know, like the Gulf of Mexico dead zone sort of deal. Um, I don't know if maybe that expands out in the in the summer more, but it's it's pretty much throughout the year. So just wanted to point that out. So we may be exaggerating the seasonality, at least in some places, is what you're saying. Yeah. Other questions? Well, as I said, I have a, a list. <laughs> so Ryan, let me ask you a quick question. I was, I was trying to 
process fully what you were saying about the Bureau of Reclamation nitrate data that were so low and that you're seeing, you're seeing higher data. And what I couldn't quite figure out is whether you were comparing the same water depth. So were the, were the BOR data from surface as well or were they deeper in the water column and then where were yours? Because oh. that could explain the differences. Um, we're, all of ours were all, all surface water. So even uh, I think the BOR was also surface water. But okay. this is a brand new graph that some of our members put together. So I need to um, check on that. That's a good, a good point um, because it would be um, different in, um, in a lower deeper. depth, I, I, deeper, yeah. For those who don't think about these things, the deeper waters are low in oxygen and the, you get denitrification going on. So it pulls down. Low oxygen waters almost never have high nitrate for that reason because of that microbial pathway. So, the, uh, okay. the river water was actually higher because it's just, I think in the rivers, they just yeah. do surface water. But yeah, yeah. That, that makes sense to me. Um, so Caroline, this idea of, as you take a mouthful of food, <laughs> sorry, I waited for that moment actually. Uh, no, I mean, this, this point about how the metals contour across the bottom sediments, you know, there is that paper that was published a number of years ago. And if you look at it, it's, you know, it's pretty uh, dramatic contouring against very few data points, right? And it shows that bullseye pattern that I always talk about. And you made the important point that there are two regions, especially on the west side, that show metal enrichments um, going all the way to the shoreline. And when I looked at your, whoops, yeah, when I looked at your plot carefully, um, you know, that's the one, especially by Salton City, is held by one point, literally by one data point. So I think this is as much a comment that is a question. And maybe, Caroline, this is a segue for you to talk a little bit about your efforts with Charlie and others. Um, you know, there aren't a lot of data. And one of the things that we're trying to do is, is, con is, is core sample bottom sediments throughout the entire basin so that we can really contour well because we think it's really important to know where the metals are as we think about what portions to keep wet, for example. And that bullseye pattern makes geochemically because the low oxygen waters in the center of the basin would enrich metals into the sediments, um, but it may not be as real a pattern as I think. So do you wanna just say a little bit about the frequency of pouring that you're doing, Caroline? Yeah, we're uh, going out and starting with big transects. So going around like through the south to the north and then um, across the Salton Sea lengthwise. Um, I think looking at this map and what Tim has just pointed out, maybe we can focus uh, a bit more on the desert shore, near shore sites, as well as the, the Salton Sea city, just to like look into more what is going on with selenium and other trace metals um, that's showing these maps because uh, you know, we need to focus on um, places that's going to be exposed in the near years, as much as the, the, uh, in the center. And Susan, I see your hand, and I was going to follow up a similar kind of thing, but I'm going to let you ask your question, and then I'll ask you a question that's related to what we're talking about. You're right. muted. There you go. <laughs> um, yeah, when I was going to see if you guys know about an effort by I think NRCS to do coring throughout the sea as well. Um, and I can put you in touch with the folks if you don't know about it. Um, but it might be great to, you know, be complimentary and, and check it out. Because I know this is something that's being planned that I think like BLM and USBR might be funding. So um, it'd be great. Yep. To Great to know. We yeah. can piggyback and, and, and there'll be things that we measure that they wouldn't be measuring. So for example, we can talk about this offline, but we, we have access to selenium isotope measurements, uh, which could do some really interesting things in terms of selenium uh, cycling, but also source relationships. Um, so yeah, do share that information with us, Caroline in particular, that'd be great. Yeah, I will. And that's, that's really great to know because we had asked them if they were able to do selenium and that was kind of a up in the air question. So I'm thrilled to hear that you're the looking at that. Are easy for us to do. We have two ICPMSs to do that, but the isotopes are tricky. There aren't that many groups in the world that do it, but it, it just happens that one of my postdocs is probably the best, former postdocs is, uh, is one of the best at that. So it'd be oh, great, great to talk. Yeah, yeah, no, that's really great. Okay. So that, that was all I wanted to say. Can I ask you the, the, the follow-up question? And it's a big question, so I'm gonna make it short and we can talk about it more of it later. 
you know, so we're really interested in selenium. We're at Riverside, right? There's that long history of selenium research here, and we're sort of picking up sure. that, that, that mantle a little bit. Um, and so I'm always interested in the source relationships. And you talked about some areas that have Colorado River water coming in, which I think historically is relatively high in selenium, but it's still a river. It's not that high. And then there are other wa wastewater sources that have potentially higher selenium. Um, so I'm wondering ultimately, like, you know, like I said, it would be great to really constrain those mass balances. Yeah. But more importantly, I'm wondering about remobilization of selenium, right? So a lot of these wetlands are on, on dry playa that was at one time lake floor, which it had a lot of selenium in it. And so we've thought a lot about changing redox and remobilizing. So if you oxidize it, you can remobilize it. And the other thing is the South Shore especially has all this gypsum crust that would dissolve if you put fresh water in and it could be suddenly giving you a big pulse of selenium from the underlying mud. So is that something that you're thinking about and exploring? Yeah, that's that's actually what Krishangi Groover is doing for her PhD. So she's working on her PhD and um, is really interested in that question. And of course, we think it's going to drive a lot of variability, you know, amongst the different wetlands out there. And so we're both thinking about it and thinking about, you know, how much money we actually have to, to constrain those things, you know, how many different kind of source things can we study, um, but really fascinated by that question, and that she's definitely measuring a lot of those parameters that you would need to look at to try to understand remobilization. I so. think it's a really big question because mm -hmm. without getting into the weeds, the changing redox really affects things. Areas yes. that are oxic now, if they become anoxic, then metals are reduced that release other metals that are absorbed to them. Yeah. Similarly, in areas that are anoxic, as they become oxic, then things oxidize and release metals. Many of these metals are more soluble in oxic waters than anoxic yeah. waters. So there's this whole kind of dynamic that ties to redox and it, it, it depends yeah. a lot on how the metals are now and how they'll be remobilized. And that yeah. is true for the margin where you're studying as well. Yeah, super fascinating. And really you should have Krishangi come on. I mean, she could give a whole talk on, you know, just that part about, um, and we're really just really trying to mesh, you know, the biogeochemistry with the biology, which I think is, it's, you know, it's really that interface between what's happening with the selenium speciation and what gets taken up at the base of the food web that drives everything because things get so concentrated depending on, you know, that interface. And so we're really trying to mesh our, you know, our two kind of expertise because, you know, that's definitely her arena, but it's, you know, it's, it's being looked into. So. And, I, and I think, you know, historically selenium has been really focused on in, in, in particular with community concern. And so you're sort of holding this really important, whatever nuggets that people are looking at. And it's, you know, it's kind of a metaphor for a lot of the other problems, but people want to know about selenium. And I hasn't, haven't been hearing as much about it recently. So I'm really delighted that you're doing all that work. And, and I'm sure many other people will want to know, not just for what you're doing, but the broader implications of it as well as related to dust and community yeah. health, and surrounding regions, et cetera. For sure, and that that those things are definitely out of our expertise, the dust and community health. But we're really interested in you know collaborating and learning from other folks that are down there. So it'd be great to talk with you and your group and everyone on the call about it. So, yeah. I, I think we should wrap it up. Were you going to say that? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'll give you the final word, Mike. But oh. I, Meng Jen, do you, did you want to ask something quickly? Uh, yes, I just wanted to uh, to ask something about the seasonal bloom, and then if I can share screen real quick. Okay, all right. Okay. So this is my research uh, plot, and this is the simulation for ammonium, and uh, ammonium will form in summertime where is where the nitrification is inhibited, so they will for ammonia during summer when temperature raise, and then ammonia is the preferred form of nitrogen for algae. So, so, so that will explain why in, in hotter temperature, they will bloom. Because there's, oh, right, get it, right. So there's always a lot of nutrient, but this summer there's even more, in part because of that water column overturn or mixing. Yeah, well, yeah. I, 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 their preferred form. Right. 
Okay, well, I, again, I'll give Mike, I'll give you the final word, but this has been a delight for me, and I wish we could go on for hours and hours, but this is really just one part of many conversations, and thanks to Mike and his group for making this possible, and I look forward to subsequent ones and to visiting ones that are already archived, and to all the speakers, universally well done. Thank you so much for staying on time and for covering incredibly important information, and, uh, and I'm sure this will spawn other conversations offline, and people have presumably have contact information for you. So I encourage anyone out there listening to uh, get in contact with these experts because they're the ones who are trying to make this all better as much as we can. So Mike. Yeah, and I'd like to share my thanks, uh, especially to, to Tim for taking on the big task of moderating a five person panel and wading through a huge, uh, a huge topic. Water quality is, is really uh, deserves much more than a, a two hour webinar. Um, but I think there's a lot of really good information. Uh, this webinar, as I mentioned, uh, has been recorded, will be posted to the Pacific Institute website. Um, they post it on YouTube as well. So uh, it will be available shortly uh, for people to go back, check out the, the individual presentations. Um, if there are additional questions, please send them to me, mcohen at packins.org, and I will pass them along to the presenters, or you can probably find everybody online anyway and just send them directly. Um, and thanks to Carlos for interpreting this. This uh, has been recorded in Spanish and we'll post this in both English and Spanish. Um, and with that, uh, we'll have additional webinars moving forward. There's a lot of uh, very interesting topics here to explore in, in future webinars. And again, I thank everyone for joining and for uh, your excellent presentations. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Have great afternoons. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Carlos. Yes, thanks, Carlos. Thanks, everyone.